First, I'm going to introduce my colleague and guru, Kathy Crow, who we are going to give a standing ovation because she recently got the Order of Canada. That's number one. And of course, I don't need to tell you about Kathy because she has been working with and for um, people in, living in poverty for many, many, many years. Um, and uh, also because she's a close colleague of Arineo. I'm not going to say a lot about Joe Cressy either. I did call you counselor, so that's a good thing. That's a good beginning. But I am going to say something that I personally think is very important, and is that you work with the Stephen Lewis Foundation before this, and that says a lot about you. And that the values of Joe and the values of Arneo are pretty much aligned. So for that, we thank you for coming today. <laughs> and for Shane Juniard, I don't have a description, but I'm going to tell you about Shane. Because it was about, sorry, I'm losing my phone. It was about a month ago, Shane, or so, maybe a bit more, that I was on my way to a press conference on the topic of people living in homelessness. And those of you that will read my CEO dispatch will see two names there. One was Joe King on my way to the press conference with whom I spoke quite at length and who I invited to the press conference and he did not come because he needed to make the $20 he needed that day. And on my way out from the press conference, um, I went to honor the three people that have died uh, living in the streets, in the memorial, where I saw Kathy, and where I saw Joe, and where I saw Adam Vaughn, who we invited and sent the regrets today for good reasons. And then I visited inside the church and spoke with the uh, 20 people that come there more or less every day to see how they were doing and what was happening. And then as I was heading to the office with my colleague, Marianne Zich, I spotted this, what I thought was a young woman from far away, I don't see at all well. And I say this because it tells you um, the taboos that we have in our own head, the hang-ups, that we have in our own head, because I said to Sean, to Shane, that if I knew he was a young man, I probably would not have really rushed there, but good thing I did. And so I basically went to him to chat, and I discovered he was not this young woman whom I wanted to help, but was this young man with a bit more of a beard and very handsome. And I said to him that there was lunch at the church and that was very cold. And he said to me, no, put your hand here, you know, on the, where comes the hot hair. And it's not cold, so I'm okay. And no, I don't want to go to have lunch now. And he had the same smile that conquers the world that he has now. And then I didn't want him to feel uncomfortable that I was so, you know, nosy. And I said, just so you know, just in case, I'm a nurse. Because I know people feel very comfortable when you say you are a nurse, but I am one. <laughs> and that's what did it to me. So Shane said to me, well, 20 years ago, I did two years of nursing at Laurentian College. Oh, no and you shared with me why you left. And then you shared with me more than that. 
And then I wrote the column that you have not seen, but I will give you where the column ends, saying to my colleagues, wouldn't be awesome, because you said that to me, I would love to get back into nursing. So the column ends saying, wouldn't it be great if Shane gets back into nursing? But then as the day was coming about, um, and we were looking to who can really bring a lived experience, my colleagues, my gurus at RNO said go through the, you know, through this group, go through that group. Um, and then I said, no, I'm not going through any group. I'm going to ask a person I know. So Shane, I am absolutely honored as, I have, as we have exchanged many, many emails now um, that, you are, that you have given us the entire day. I am absolutely, for, on behalf of my colleagues and myself, uh, we are privileged to learn from you, to hear you, to hear whatever you have to say to us today, and many more days than today, because the relationship is not over and it will never be over. So thank you for being with us. And with that, I'm going to ask first Kathy to speak, then Joe, and the best for the end, and that's Shane. Thank you. everybody. Thank you. Dr. Grinspan, congratulations yourself. Um, last time I saw you on television, you were being a nurse, helping somebody who had collapsed at a shelter at a press conference with uh, the Minister of Health. I mean, many people saw that, so thank you for your work in RNAO. Um, I, I, I'm going to um, try to sum up some of the issues around homelessness. Um, some of you know I've been a street nurse for over 30 years. Uh, I've worked at community health centers, various locations, and now I'm based at Ryerson. Um, strangely, not in the nursing department, <clears throat> but, in the <laughs> but in the politics department that they're supporting all the work that I'm doing. Um, so what I usually start with is just the concept that for me as a nurse, there are two national programs in Canada that have meant the world to me and to us as nurses. The first is Medicare, obviously, and we're still always trying to protect it. But the second is our national housing program. And I was a street nurse at the corner of Sherburne and Dundas when that program was cancelled in 1993, and I didn't even know that it was cancelled. But when we had that program, we built 20,000 units of affordable supportive housing a year across the country. And that's why we have to get it back. And that ties in with the June election, because if we get it back, the province has a role to also spend money for housing. Because we don't have that program, there are what I call hot spots that myself and colleagues work on, and I'm just going to name them briefly. And if any of you are from nursing schools or, or RNAO chapters and you want me to come in and do a fuller presentation, it's all images, PowerPoint, no numbers or slides with graphs, I can do that. So the first one is the status of Indigenous housing in this country, both on reserve and off reserve and the horribly high proportion of homeless people in our cities that are indigenous, and the high death rate. That's number one. The next is the conditions of our shelter system, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Um, the conditions in our shelters across the province because they've been underfunded and there's been no infrastructure money put into them. The conditions are horrendous and crowded. There's also this thing called gentrification, which means that many cities are losing some of their shelters, and that's happening in Toronto and in Kingston and in other cities. So we're losing shelters because of land value. The next hot spot is the high level of outdoor sleeping that is what I call, it's forced, it's a little bit by choice, but it's also forced. Because the reality is the shelters are full, 
and they're unsafe and they're inadequate. So in Toronto, we now have a 31-year-old volunteer program in the winter run by the faith sector, volunteer, where people have to move nightly. And we now have close to 800 uh, men and women and trans folks that are sleeping in places that are not real shelters. The next hot spot I want to mention is just disease, disease and infestations and the health conditions that happen in shelters. So it ranges from what you would expect, including we've had a tuberculosis outbreak many years ago, to the recent strep A infection in Seton House that lasted for 18 months bed bug infestations, et cetera, et cetera. And so imagine H1N1 or during SARS, what happens in that crowded shelter system. The next hot spot is what I call the fastest growing group of who's becoming homeless, and that's families and children with an increasingly high number of refugees that is still a little bit hard to get our handle on what's happening there. I keep adding to this list of hot, spot, hot spots. About 10, 15 years ago, I added climate change because it was clear that around the world, poor and vulnerable populations were being affected by climate change, but it's also happening in Canada. So we hear about that during extreme heat and extreme cold in the city. But when we have floods in the Don River in Toronto, homeless people living down there get flooded out. So that's just another one. Another one I added a number of years ago is hate and discrimination. And we used to only see hate crimes against homeless people in the United States, but we do now see them in Canada. And that discrimination takes many forms. It takes the form of violence, but it also takes the form of urban structures, such as how our park benches look, or um, architectural designs that prevent somebody from maybe sitting or sleeping in a location. Um, and I'm probably missing a couple, but that gives you the gist of the nature of problems that frontline workers are dealing with. So I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, I think we're here because of the upcoming provincial election and the opportunity you've had to try to influence that in Queen's Park. And just know that nursing has a huge role. And I, I'm going to leave this with Doris, but I'll also send it to her electronically later. And it's just some questions to ask specifically around the province, around when candidates come to your door. With the, with the party, whoever is asking you or knocking at your door, would they eliminate vacancy decontrol? for example, um, would they commit to matching and ensuring um, money for affordable housing when the federal money comes? Would they commit to a standalone provincial program to build social housing, such as co-ops? Would they commit to funding cities like Toronto and Ottawa and Kingston to repair social housing? Would they commit to 3,000 new units of affordable housing? that's truly affordable? And would they increase social assistance rates? So that's just to give you an idea of specific Ontario programs. And I'll, I'll wind up just by saying, um, I ran provincially twice in Toronto Centre uh, when George Smitherman um, resigned to run for mayor. And at that point, I got the highest number of votes. I ran for the NDP, um, and it was a terrific experience. Um, and we actually had a nursing canvas during one of my runs. And I wanted to encourage you to not be afraid to take part in um, the June election. And you can do so by just finding a candidate that you like, um, volunteer, and, and it can be as simple as being in the office and stuffing envelopes or, or, or asking people what they need when they come into the office, to door knocking, doing leaflet drops, um, but the best is when you're canvassing and when you're candidate canvassing, canvassing with the candidate because you will see things at the door that a nurse is best to see. I can recall seeing somebody with, with um, a double amputee that was on the floor in his unit that was unlocked when we knocked on the door. You see things that as a nurse you then can go back and talk to the candidate about 
and then you can also get help for the person. It's just fabulous. It's true community health nursing at the door. So I just encourage you to think of doing that because nurses are amazing when they're at the door talking to people. Thank you. Well, it's always hard to follow Kathy. Um, Listen, let me just start off. My name is Joe Cressy. I'm the city councillor actually for this area here. It's Trinity Spadina in downtown Toronto. Um, you're welcome to clap for that. Why not? Sure. Um, listen, I guess a couple things. First of all, I'm delighted to be here and pleased. And I say that largely because in my experience, and I've worked closely with the RNAO for years, whether it was at the Stephen Lewis Foundation, where I worked before City Hall, or at City Hall on issues like safe injection sites, supervised injection services, that the RNAO is, and always has been, a deeply caring and principled organization. Um, and, and on that basis, my background is in public health myself, and HIV and AIDS work primarily, and, and you're on the front lines. You know what the challenges are, and you also know what the solutions are. In fact, you're part of the solution. And so when Doris sent me a note the other day and said, you need to be here, cancel whatever it is you were planning to do, I said, OK. <laughs> and so um, listen, to, I'll say a few words, and I'll build on where Kathy left off. And perhaps we're here in the heart of downtown Toronto, so I'd like to focus in the conversation as it relates to homelessness and housing um, in the context of this city. And on that basis, I really will zero in on a couple points. One, to, do, to deal with overdose, and uh, you've heard a bit about that today, and the other is housing. But I would take a step back, just before that. You're here in the heart of downtown, you've been walking around. How's the city doing? Where are we? Well, if, if you look at top 10 rankings, on so many levels, we're told that we're doing really well as a city. Everybody's talking about the city of Toronto these days. You know, you have Google and their Sidewalk Labs project coming to the waterfront. Amazon is thinking of locating their second headquarters here. Uh, the Economist magazine, which of course is nurses you read daily. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> the Economist magazine says that we are the world's most livable city. Uh, BBC says that the world, the world's most diverse city. Wired magazine. I didn't know what it was until I found this stat. Wired magazine says we're the world's most intelligent city. I mean, we're doing well. You know, on some basis, you know, the Argos won the Grey Cup. The, the, our soccer club, the TFC won the soccer club. You know, so on some levels, we're doing pretty well as a city. Who's that? The skaters. Okay, they're not from here. And the Olympics. But if we win gold medals, just assume they're from Toronto. So. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> okay. So, you know, in one sense, and you just, all you have to do is go outside. I represent downtown and look up, and we have the highest number of towers under construction of any city in all of North America. So on the one hand, you have the world looking to Toronto to say, look how well they're doing. Look at the level of inclusion that they represent. Look at the level of wealth they're creating. They're doing pretty good. But then there's a whole series of other lists that I'm paying attention to that don't get the same level of co coverage. But if we're at the top of it, or them, it's for the very wrong reasons. So the United Way here in Toronto has said that Toronto is now the inequality capital of Canada. That the gap between the rich and the poor is growing at a more pronounced rate in this city than any other city in all of Canada. So how are we the world's most livable if that's the case? That the Children's Aid Society has pointed out that we are the child poverty capital of Canada. 29% of young people in this city are living in poverty. 29%. And if you go to the challenge, that poverty is highly concentrated in some neighborhoods. So in 14 neighborhoods in our city, it's 40% of kids growing up in poverty in the world's most livable city. How do you square that? And so if the test of a city, if the fundamental test of a city, and many of you are coming from not cities but towns as well, if the test of a small town or a large town or a city is how well we are caring for the most vulnerable, we are failing as a city. 
And so all those top 10 lists to me mean nothing if we're not caring for each other, if we're doing the work that you do and the RNAO does better. And so on that basis, let's look at two issues in the city that I'll touch on. One is overdose and the other is housing. Overdose, which you know inside and out as the RNAO. In 2004, in the city of Toronto, we had, 100, we had 146 people die due to overdoses in our city. It was 2004, 146 people. In 2015, it was 258 people. We don't have numbers yet for 2016, but what we can tell you anecdotally, and this is certainly the case recently, is that the number of people in our city dying due to overdose has been increasing every year, and it is escalating rapidly. And, you know, what pains me is that we talk now about, well, we should be talking about the emergency that we have, but we talk about the crisis. Everybody uses a different word. If people are dying at this level, I don't care what you call it, we should do better. Um, but this emergency we have, we're all talking about it now, but the reality is it was an emergency in 2004 when we had 146 people die. What's changed, and it pains me to say this, is that with the arrival of fentanyl, and the degree to which fentanyl is being cut and laced into recreational drugs. In 2004, people dying due to overdose were largely habitual drug users who far too often were dying in the shadows, in alleyways and in washrooms and in back and in, and in stairwells. And today, I had a 24-year-old young woman in my ward who did ecstasy. It was cut with fentanyl and she died in a club a couple months ago. And so somehow the public is now paying attention. The lives mattered in 2004 and they matter today. But I have to tell you, if it's taking this type of scale of tragedy for us to wake up to the overdose crisis, to start talking about drug use as a public health issue, as opposed to a criminal issue, then that's a good thing. But it is terrible that we've had such level of death to get to this point. Now this sea change, when I started working on supervised injection in our city, I called, well this was two and a half years ago, and I called Doris and the RNAO and said, we're going to announce that the city's going to proceed, that we're going to open sites. Two years ago, there was a debate in the city about, should we do it? Should we open harm reduction facilities? Today, the discussion is, why can't you open more sooner and quicker? That's a sea change that the level of consciousness, consciousness that's taking place around the stigma associated with drug use, the need to implement public health responses from treatment to prevention to harm reduction, that has changed drastically. I know Minister Hoskins was here earlier talking about that, but the simple answer, the simple fact, unfortunately, is despite all of the the good steps that the federal government has taken, that the provincial government has taken, that I believe we've taken at the city, none of us are doing enough. I chair the city's Toronto drug strategy and we've trained 1,600 frontline city staff in how to administer naloxone. We've distributed 3,000 naloxone kits. We've opened three supervised injection sites so far. We opened another one yesterday, actually, at Fred Victor. A fourth is gonna open in two weeks. We need to open another 20. They should be embedded in our health facilities. We can and must do more. And because, as you know, behind every number, it doesn't matter how many people are dying, behind every number is, is a person. These are individuals. And it can happen to any one of us. And so we're failing on that. But if we're failing in any way in the most pronounced and visible area when it comes to the issues of poverty and homelessness, it's on housing. Kathy went through some of the key touchstones, but I just want to paint a picture on it. On the housing ladder, from shelters to supportive and transitional housing to permanent housing, it's a ladder, right? If you're living rough on the streets and you need a warm place to stay, there needs to be access to it as a shelter. And it needs to be a safe and supportive environment. But then if you're going to transition into permanent housing, often you need that supportive housing in between to ensure you have the services and the supports to get to permanent affordable housing. Well, here's what it looks like. We have a waiting list in the city of Toronto of 181,000 people waiting for affordable housing. 181,000 people. If you put your name on the waiting list for affordable housing, you're gonna be on that waiting list for 10 years right now. The list is getting longer every year. That's permanent housing. If you're looking for supportive housing, 
So if you are living rough on the streets and you've found space in a shelter and you say, you know what, I'm ready. I'm ready to move into a supportive housing arrangement to work with health professionals and employment counselors to then move on, there is a waiting list of 13,000 people for supportive housing. It's going to take you four years to get a spot. And then at the, at the first rung, our shelters, they're over capacity. What does over capacity look like? I'll tell you, a group called Sistering. Sistering, they're not even a shelter. They run what we call a 24-hour drop in on Bloor Street, not far from here. They have space for 25 to 30 women to come in at any time of the day to get, find a warm place to stay. They don't have beds, they have 25 chairs. It's a 24-hour drop-in. On a nightly basis, they usually have around 60 people sleeping there. You line up to get a chair, and if you didn't get a chair, you're sleeping on the floor underneath the chair. That's what our system looks like right now. It looks like St. Felix. St. Felix is a, a respite site. It's, it's not Queen West. It's in the heart of what Vogue magazine called the trendiest neighborhood in the world. Well, St. Felix has space for 60 people. We usually have 100 people. You sleep on mats on the floor, 12 inches, 12 to 15 inches apart, and we have one nurse who's provided four hours a day. They're open seven days a week. It's not working. And so, I guess, I, so as not to take too much time, as I've painted this portrait, I would close and just say, in a city like ours, why isn't it better? Why are we letting down the most vulnerable? In part, I will tell you, and this is at the political level uh, and at the community level, people are scared. People are scared of that which they don't understand. People are scared of the other. A couple weeks ago, I had the city buy a building to put a shelter in, in the Upper East Annex on Davenport Road, not far from here. It's a very wealthy part of town. And I had the local residents association uh, state that they were already overburdened with what they called social problem housing. People are not problems, but they're scared. They're scared of that which they don't understand. There's a lack of, there's a lack of political power, which is part of the reason there's not change, because, and here's the simple fact when it comes to politics, homeowners vote, and far too often a lot of people who are homeless and struggling don't. So the politicians listen to the voters. So political power needs to shift. And I think the biggest thing, and I'd say this simply, is that there's a lack of empathy in places of power and privilege and in politics. That when you look at who politicians are and what their backgrounds are, to be frank, you have a lot of lawyers. You don't have a lot of frontline nurses and social workers. And if your lived experience is one that has always had privilege and your lived experience is not that which opened your eyes to other people's suffering and experiences, then that's your frame of reference. And so we don't have enough empathy for pe and a willingness for elected officials to seek to understand the other. And so that's where I think the challenge is. I find hope, I will tell you, as, as a young city councillor, because I do believe that we're better when we care for each other. I think we are stronger when we care for each other. Frankly, I don't know why else we would live a life if we don't try to improve the lives of others. What else would we be here for? But I, I also have hope because of groups like RNAO. Because you spend two and a half days sitting here at Hart House and up at Queen's Park saying, how do we make things better? That you're on the front lines, not just day to day taking care of people, but also here in moments like this, fighting for better change. Um, and I guess I would just close in saying, I mentioned that Davenport site where I find hope and that the local residents association might have fought it. But the day that it opened, we opened this site for a temporary emergency shelter a couple weeks ago. Um, a local mother came by with her young kid. They lived in, tr in a public housing building around the corner. And they came by and the little girl, who was about six years old, had drawn a picture that said, welcome to the neighborhood, we'll take care of you. And that picture is on the front door so that when people come in, because they know that it could happen to any one of us. And so I find hope in the work you do and in the knowledge that we will always fight on. Thank you very much.
Well, I was told that people were interested in the lived experience of a homeless person, so I could only try to answer your curiosity. Um, for myself, I don't live in the shelters, I live on the street. And you would ask, why wouldn't I go to the shelter? And to me, the choice is pretty clear. You can go into a drug-infested, violent place, or you can learn to fend for yourself. So that's what I've done. The shelters, to me, represent a canned solution that just doesn't work. And uh, if you're lucky, like me, and you can fend for yourself and earn some money and get your own food, then it's kind of just what I've chosen to do while I am on the street. I don't think I really have any answers to the problem. I mean, obviously, as a homeless person, I need a lot of help and support. And uh, I would think that what is lacking is that uh, homeless people don't come from a can. They're all unique individuals. So. The, there is an absolute lacking of um, individual support. Um, you go into the shelter, you're just all treated the same. And it's really disheartening, actually. It's overwhelming when you already don't have anywhere to go. And uh, Harder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Where are you from, Shane? Uh, I'm originally from Belleville. And, uh, I ended. I did live in Toronto for about eight years, and I came back here when I became homeless. Um, and you were you were in nursing? Uh, I was in nursing when I was 20 years old. I did that for two years, and then I followed my dad. I became a tradesman, so I am a licensed tradesman. Mm -hmm. But um, actually, the the biggest problem for me is the shelter system. Like, I just I cannot stand to be in there. It's it's a nightmare because uh, I'm from the LGBT community, and there is literally no place for gay men in the shelter system. There's nothing. There is support for youth from the community, but not for us. Um, you. Like, I'm not even going to mention the stuff that goes on in there. You can imagine. In Seton House, everyone in there comes from the prisons. Um, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I've never had legal trouble. And when you're gentle and soft, kind of like me, and you get thrown into that environment, you'll want to get out as soon as possible. And now, actually, there is another, people may not know, there's an incentive to be on the street. If you are on the street, you will get a bursary offer from the Streets to Home program, so it's kind of odd. They're, they're proposing that we go into the shelters, but they're offering more money if we stay out on the streets, so how do you reconcile that? It's kind of strange. You know, the system workers, they come out to me on the street and they start complaining about their own jobs. <laughs> they do. They say the system sucks, and you know, well, thanks for telling me that. That really makes me feel better. <laughs> I do. Yeah. You know, if I'm in the mood to share, I'll share a lot, but you know, this is just, ugh. Yeah, it's what the one word I would use is frustrating or frustrage. Because, you know, I was just going to say the, the people, there's homeless people are all unique individuals. Like, they're not, I'm sure a lot of people are scared of them because they think they're all the same thing. But there's a lot of us that are educated and just need a little bit of help just to get back into the world that we came from because. I wasn't born on the street, obviously. I just I was born into a okay home and had some trouble and fell down. <laughs> and what type of housing options would help? The shelter doesn't work. Well, I was housed once through um, the shelter system a long time ago when I was first homeless, and what I know what happens to a lot of homeless people is that they get into a housing situation with. Uh, in a, obviously, on welfare, you get $300 or $325 a month for your apartment. You cannot get an apartment for that price. Where do you get an apartment for $325? So you'll get a room at best, and you'll have roommates, and a lot of them, you know, respectfully, they'll end up being hardcore drug addicts. And what happens is, 
you know, drug users, especially people who use like heroin and crack cocaine, they make terrible choices. They invite the wrong people to their place and it'll just spiral down from there. Like from my own point of view, we all need our own individual place so you can enforce your boundaries and say, you know, like that's how I deal with other homeless people. I just, I choose who I deal with. They say, you're, you're in, you're out, you're out, you're out. You know, that's how you have to work with homeless people because they steal from you. Uplift and all that stuff, so. And, and can I ask, and sorry, so as we're dealing here with RNAO, um, there's the housing piece, and what about the type of health services and the supports around it on the streets for some like what could be improved oh. there? Um, well, first of all, I don't think I am getting any health support on the street. <clears throat> yeah. The only thing that they have done is during the cold peri weather periods, what Streets to Homes does, they come to me, I'll be sleeping on a grate, they'll come at four in the morning and they'll say, Streets to Homes, it's a cold weather alert. And it's like, yeah, thanks, I noticed it's cold. <laughs> And then, then, they'll, then they'll want to take me to the sh uh, respite center or whatever at four in the morning, and then you get kicked out at six. And you know, my doctor says, I have to sleep all night long for my, for my mental health. I have to sleep. And they, they wake me up every night. And I told them, but they still keep doing it. Well, it's our job. So, <laughs> what can I say? They're, they're doing nothing but poorly impacting my health. And I just contacted my housing worker last week and I haven't heard back from her. So there's a lot of people at Streets to Homes. I looked it up on the internet because luckily I'm a homeless person who can hang on to an iPhone. <laughs> so I can research all this stuff, but um, there's a lot of people working there and I don't know what they're doing. Anyone else that would like to learn from I just wanted to share that I had the privilege last night of sitting down and having a great conversation with Shane and you know he just gave me such insights and so much to think about but I think uh, besides you know, we have a common love of cats which I'll never forget that sketch Shane has a lovely pet um, but he talked to me about not only the boundaries but also the hope right it is about seeing his situation as um, this is an intermediate thing. This is, and I guess Shane, I was so moved by your ability to stay focused on that hope, on bringing yourself to a better place. But I, I, as I'm going to sleep last night, I'm thinking, I want you to know that everyone in this room and our 41,000 other members of RNAO um, surround you with that hope. And I think, you know, the question that you were asked by, uh, by Joe Cressy is, you know, you are there reaching into your inner strength for hope and you see a goal of a better life. And I want you to know that in any way that we can support you, I hope that your experience with us today at RNAO, at Queen's Park, here, we were so honored that you took the time to be with us. But I guess I just wanted the opportunity to, to share that you really touched me with, you know, your view of hope and what that looks like and what you do day in and day out. And you've inspired me to want to be a part of helping you build that hope and working with people like Kathy Crow and Joe Cressy and many other people who will do what we can to not just have a Band-Aid effect, but to really learn from you and to get sustainable solutions so that you can move on with your life in dignity as Shane Schrenard, who didn't, didn't come into this world on the street, and I know you've got amazing goals in your life. And so we're here with, with you and for you. Shane, it's Amanda. I met you last night. I had a couple questions first. Did you have a bath? 
Uh, yeah, very long one. <laughs> Lived up to its expectations. <laughs> Good. It, it was great. <laughs> Can you tell me, if you're willing, what your normal day looks like? Um, right now, yeah, it's pretty simple. Uh, I sleep up by the Eaton Center uh, because that's where um, the best quality grate is. I guess that's. <laughs> um, and I go down to. I get up at about. 5.30 in the morning and uh, I go to Union Station and I panhandle for most of the day there because uh, right now I'm saving up for a new iPhone and um, so I use the money for like I buy food and sometimes I get food given to me and stuff like that. I get a lot of clothes given to me so there is a lot of kindnesses from strangers and you know they're very generous with money too. So. Um, and then after I've done that for most of the day, I go inside the train station, thank goodness that's there because they have the best, best public washrooms in the whole city. So they're decent and they're clean and uh, I can go in there and attend to my personal care and there's free Wi-Fi and then back to the Eaton Center at night and sleep. Got it? Can I ask where you're showering? Pardon me? If you're showering, what does that look like for you? Showering? Yeah. Oh, I sponge bath inside the, um, there's a, the one wash, there's a washroom at Union Station that's private with a door that closes. So I don't use the shower, there's the shower facilities at 128 Peter Street, but I've always heard they're in disrepair and I don't want to go there anyways because when you're homeless, it, anytime you have to travel, it's time and effort or money that you don't have. So TTC is 325 if you mm -hmm. want to go somewhere. So, um, like, and the laundry facilities are always broken, so I have to go and I have to raise money and pay for that on my own. So it's just better, like, um, I learned, like, how to sponge bath properly as, in a, as a nursing student, so. Uh, I have used uh, some, I wouldn't say that nurses generally are given great survival training, but, I mean, there has been a lot of benefit. <laughs> the only thing I have to be careful of is not trying to take care of people. <laughs> because I don't have the strength to do that. So if was, if was one thing, one, that will make life better, what would that be? One thing, uh, for me, just feeling... For you. Uh, just more personal empowerment, because, you know, when you're homeless, you feel isolated, for one thing, and, you know, Homeless people, like everyone else, everyone is on a journey of growth, right? And when you get, achieve that level of personal empowerment, know what you want, know where you're going, and especially getting my health back, because you know what, I know no health, no life. Because that's basically why I'm homeless, is I lost my health. <laughs> so, we will help you get your health back, but I want to talk about what you just said about empowerment and personal growth. Mm. You helped us all with our personal growth. So thank you.